morning, everybody. Happy Sabbath. Thank you for your uh, beautiful prayer, Darren. It's very appropriate. Uh, that's our subject today. We're going to be talking about prayer. You know, we're still somewhat on the infancy of the new year. We talked for a couple of weeks about the importance, the priority of the Word and spending time in the Word. And another very important aspect of the Christian disciplines that uh, strengthen our faith is, of course, prayer. So we thought it would be appropriate to talk about this uh, very important subject today. It's as important to the Christian as breathing is to your physical body. A young mother was on the phone with a friend in the living room, and her friend asked her if she could pray for her. So the mother began to pray over the phone for her friend. Right about then, her five-year-old girl came bouncing off into the room. She paused. She could hear her mother praying. And her eyes got very wide, and she said, Is that God? Can I talk to him? <laughs> very excited by the idea that someone could talk directly to God. But you don't need a telephone, and you can talk directly to God. You know, the angels marvel. And this is a, basically a paraphrase from the book Steps to Christ, which I recommend you read the chapter in that book called The Privilege of Prayer. What a tremendous chapter. And in that book, Steps to Christ, she says the angels who long to be in the presence of God, their greatest joy is to crowd in and around the presence of God. I mean, what else would be the most um, wonderful spot in the universe? The, the very core of splendor and ecstasy would be the presence of God. And the angels just rejoice to be close to His presence. And here we have an opportunity on earth to draw near to God through prayer, and most people are ambivalent. They're indifferent. Act like they could care less. And I'm just not talking about the people in the world. I'm talking about people even in the church that don't understand what a wonderful privilege we have in prayer. So we're going to talk a little about that today. And, you know, I thought I'd start with a passage you'll find in Luke chapter 11. If you have your Bibles, you can go there. Luke chapter 11. And you read in verse 1. Now it came to pass as he was praying in a certain place that when he finished, that one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples. Now when Jesus prayed, something happened to him. They noticed a difference. Matter of fact, if you don't lose your place in Luke 11, you can go to Luke 9, verse 29, and it says there, as he prayed, the appearance of his face was altered and his robe became white and glistening. His appearance was altered by prayer. What happened to Moses when he spent time in the presence of God praying? He began to glow, so much so that the children of Israel said, could you please do something to shade yourself? And he veiled his face. Through that time in the presence of God, uh, it, it actually showed. I don't know if any of you still have or you remember when as kids we would have this green plastic material, you'd expose it to light and it would glow. And when Stephen was little, we bought these uh, little stars and planets and Saturn and moons that we stuck up with this paper, their plastic things, around the light in his room. When we turned off the light at night, at least for a little while, after being exposed to light, it would glow for a while. Some of us remember the early Timex watches. We thought that was the most incredible thing where it would sort of glow for a while after the light went out. You could see the little numbers on your watch. But then it would fade. And you'd have to hold it up to the lamp again. I remember being so fascinated by that. I had a little West Clock clock there by my bed. And, and uh, I'd hold it up to the light bulb as close as I could get it and turn off the light. And I'd look at it glow and I'd watch until it slowly faded. And I'd turn on the light again, hold it back up there again. <laughs> And I know I had to, it needed regular exposure to keep glowing. So you all know what I'm talking about. We're kind of like that. If you're going to let your light shine, you need regular exposure to the source of all light. Now Jesus says, I am the light of the world. And he says, you are the light of the world. So they saw Jesus coming from his private prayer, and they saw that he was visibly energized by it. And in awe, they looked at him and they said, wow, we must not know anything about prayer. Lord, teach us to pray so we get out of it what you're getting out of it. 
And then they said, as John, the greatest of the prophets, the Baptist, taught his disciples to pray. Now, you know, one very important thing we learned from this, prayer can be taught. And it's entirely appropriate to ask to be taught to pray biblically and to pray right. Now, I'm not doing this to teach you everything about prayer because I feel like I need to be taught. I don't feel guilty about that because the apostles thought they needed to be taught how to pray. They realized something was missing. I read about some of the spiritual giants of history and how they prayed, and I thought, Phew. you know, we sing that song. We were going to close this message with that song, Sweet Hour of Prayer, but I didn't want to make you feel guilty because most people don't pray an hour. And we sing that song, but it isn't really true. But some of those spiritual giants, they did. So back to Luke 11. They said, teach us to pray. And what did Jesus say? When you pray, say. In Matthew it says, when you pray, pray in this manner. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. As in heaven, so in earth. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our sins as we forgive everyone that is indebted to us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. This is, of course, a little different than what you would find in Matthew chapter 6, what we typically call the Lord's Prayer, which is really not the Lord's Prayer. It should be called the Disciples' Prayer. If you want the Lord's Prayer, you read John 17. That's where the Lord is really praying. Here he's telling us how we ought to pray, and it's an outline for prayer. That, that again, is really a subject for another message. We could spend a lot of time talking about prayer in one year and probably benefit from it all. So what is prayer? You know, there's a quote from the book Steps to Christ, uh, page 93. Prayer is the opening of the heart to God as to a friend. Not that it's necessary in order to make known to God what we are, but in order to enable us to receive Him. Prayer does not bring God down to us, but it brings us up to Him. Jesus says your heavenly Father knows what things you have need of before you pray. And so prayer is never to inform God what our needs or wants are. Is there anything God doesn't know? So is there anything about our prayers that are informing God? Anything shocking Him? There's nothing that surprises God in your prayer. So what is prayer really doing? Prayer is transforming you. Prayer is giving God permission to answer your prayers because right now this world is held hostage by an enemy. The devil is the prince of this world. And by your going beyond this world to God, you're saying, Lord, I need outside help to live your life in this world. You are, you're giving God permission to activate and mobilize his power in your life and it is transforming you. You become like the people you talk to. My brother and I could always tell, my mother was very dramatic. And uh, she was an actress, so that would stand to reason. But my brother and I could always tell who she was talking to on the phone without having her ever reference their name by how she changed her voice whenever she talked to them. She had friends from English. She'd get on the phone. All of a sudden, she had an English accent. She had a friend from Texas, Texas accent. Uh, we, we knew a lot of her friends, and she would immediately transform who she was to be like the person she was talking to. And I don't know whether it was conscious or subconscious, but it, we could always tell. And in the same way, we are transformed. Yeah, have any of you seen people do that before they start talking to you? Maybe you've even done that. You talk to a friend, you start talking like them. And uh, that's how it is with God. The more time you spend talking to Jesus, could the enemies of the apostles tell that they had been with Jesus by how they conducted themselves. Yeah, and so the more we talk to Jesus, the more like Jesus will become. We're transformed by it. Matthew 6, verse 8. Therefore, do not be like them, for your Father knows what things you have need of before you even ask Him. Now keep in mind that while God knows what you need before you pray, there is a lot of things that he will do for you when you pray, otherwise he will not do. It is true, God sends the rain and the sunshine on the good and the evil, but there's a whole lot of unanswered prayers because people don't ask. 
the Lord and all of heaven is waiting to do things for us when we ask that otherwise he will not do. And sometimes we're afraid to trouble God because we think he's busy and we don't ask him for little things. Is there anything too small for the Lord? No. Does the Lord rejoice when you even approach him with little things that you might think are trivial? He is so happy to talk to you because he loves you. You're not going to weary him if you're sitting there looking at all the varieties of toothpaste at Walmart and saying, I don't know which one to get. I might get the wrong one. Can you call upon the Lord with things like that? And does God say, look, look, I got a long line of people up here in heaven waiting for requests. Can you not bother me with that stuff? No, there's never going to be anything too small for you to ask God. So ask. When and how often should we pray? Now, I don't even know if I'm going to get to the part about prayer changes things. I'm just kind of setting the stage on prayer here. Well, David said, Psalm 55, 17, Evening, morning, and at noon, I will pray and cry aloud, and he will hear my voice. Now, David probably did that. I mean, the one who wrote 150 psalms, or at least many of them, he talked to God a lot. He learned it out there on the fields of Bethlehem in solitude, communing with God. But then when he became king, he got busy and he said, I got to schedule some time. By the way, time with God is not found, it's made. You need to make up your mind to schedule that time. Say, I'm going to pray at these times. Daniel, did Daniel read David's writings? If you know your Bible chronology, Daniel lived after David. Daniel no doubt read the Bible. He says he did. Daniel read the Psalms. Daniel read where David said, morning, evening, and at noon will I pray. That could be part of the reason it says in Daniel 6, verse 10. When Daniel knew they signed the writing that he was going to the lion's den, he went home in his upper room, and with his windows open towards Jerusalem, he knelt down on his knees three times that day. When? Morning, evening, and at noon, I'm guessing. And he prayed, and he gave thanks before his God as his custom since early years. He'd always done it teaching your young people good habits of prayer, stay with them. Acts 12.5 Peter therefore is kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. You ever been part of a church that had a 24-hour prayer vigil? Well, that's what they did when Peter was in prison after James had been killed. And so here they're praying without ceasing. 1 Thessalonians 5.16 Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. How do you pray without ceasing? How do you breathe? How often do you breathe? What's your breathing schedule? Or is it pretty much without ceasing? You know, I could predict something about your life without having known you at all, and I guarantee it's true, that you've been breathing all your life. Isn't that right? Why? Why? Because if you hadn't been, you wouldn't be here now. So when you, I guess your doctors could explain it, but your diaphragm subconsciously has messages coming from a unique part of your brain that teaches you to breathe. And when certain oxygen levels get too low, it becomes very strong for you to breathe. You start craving it. Go underwater and hold your breath for a while. And eventually, you're going to start becoming desperate for air. Would God, we all felt that way about communion with him. What does it mean to walk with the Lord? That's the expression used in the Bible. It means to be in a constant state of communion with God. So when I talk about praying morning, evening, and at noon, it's good probably to schedule time, even if they're you know, not long prayers, but you have regular times of prayer where you connect with God and you remember He's your source for everything. When I talk about praying without ceasing, and it's not me, it's the Bible talks about it, it's talking about a walk with God where you're throwing up little prayers all the time. I pray sometimes while I'm preaching. And I hope you're praying while I'm preaching. Now, I know you pray that it'll end, but I mean other prayers for me while I'm preaching. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, we should always be in an attitude of prayer. You ever met someone that you feel maybe you should witness to and you don't know what to say and you send up prayers right then? Which leads me to another point about prayer. What's the appropriate posture for prayer? Um, is it right to kneel when you pray? Yes, it is appropriate. 
The Bible tells us that they knelt in the Old Testament. Solomon knelt when they dedicated the temple. The Bible tells us Daniel knelt upon his knees. We just read that and he prayed. Paul knelt. Jesus knelt. It's very appropriate to kneel and pray. Why do we kneel? Does your body language say anything about respect? Yeah. Uh, when you bow before someone, you are recognizing them as a superior. Uh, people will bow before a king. They do a lot of it in you know, Japan. They actually they bow to people as a sign. If you're going to kneel before someone, it should be kneeling before God. That doesn't mean you always need to kneel, but I think in your private devotions, did Daniel? If you're able. What if you've you know, if you got bad joints and you, get, you can get down, okay, but you can't get back up again. The Lord understands that. So I'm not saying that you, know, you should be too hard on yourself if it's difficult physically to do that. I know that some places when you kneel, all you can think about is how sore your knees are. And you know, that's not really prayer at a point. But um, it was very important to um, the founders of this church. I don't know if you know, Uriah Smith was missing one of his legs. And he actually developed a prosthetic leg that could bend and kneel. Believe it or not, he was responsible for one of the first bending artificial legs because he wanted to kneel when he prayed. And he could kneel okay on one leg, but not the other. And they just, they believed that was very, George Washington. Someone went to Congress one day and they said, which one is Washington? They said, when we have the prayer, he's the one who kneels. Did you know that? And so uh, they believed that was important to show reverence for God, humility before God. Peter prayed while he was swimming. He said, Lord, save me, right? Um, the thief on the cross, he couldn't kneel. And he prayed, saved his life. Nehemiah prayed as he was standing before the king, pouring his uh, wine. And so, you know, you, you could be in any posture when you pray. And that's what it means when it says that we pray without ceasing. Just be in an attitude of walking with God and talking with God. In the book Steps to Christ, again, page 70, each morning consecrate yourself to God for that day. Surrender all of your plans to Him. So morning is a good time to pray. When did the manna fall? In the morning. Good time to read your Bible. Good time to pray. Uh, Usually, it's a time when you sort of are calibrating your day. It's a good time to focus and realize that God is your help and strength right there at the beginning, in the morning. Consecrate yourself to God for that day. Surrender all of your plans to Him to be carried out or given up as His providence will indicate. Thus, day by day, you may be giving your life into the hands of God, and thus your life will be molded more and more after the life of Christ. Through communing with Christ, by fixing your eyes on Him first thing in the day, you're creating the pattern of who you want to be like, who you want to guide yourself through that day. I was reading about Martin Luther, and one uh, author said, Luther purposed praying twice a day, the first business of the morning and the last at night. Prayer is not something that we should put off. We must pray whether we're in the mood or not. And that's a quote from Luther. Sometimes you don't feel like praying, which is usually when you need to pray the most. It was Wesley's strict habit to daily spend one hour in prayer in the morning and then another hour in the evening. John Wesley shook the world by his preaching because he first shook heaven and hell by his praying. His preaching had the sense of eternal urgency because he had touched eternity with his knees. And I could go down and tell you about many of the great reformers and there are several of them several of the great missionaries and reformers died on their knees. You know why? Not because praying's bad for you, but because they spent so much time on their knees, it made sense some of them would die that way. David Livingston was found dead on his knees, praying by his cot. George Whitfield died with his Bible open on his bed on his knees. And they just spent hours on their knees. So it shouldn't surprise us that they... Might be found dying that way. That's a good way to go. In communion with God. So what are some of the things we should pray for? Pray for mercy. First thing you ought to pray for is that God will have mercy on you because it's through surrendering ourselves to the Lord and asking for His forgiveness, we then basically open the, uh, the portals for every other blessing. If you're an enemy of God and you've not asked Him to forgive your sins, well, let not the 
unbelieving or the unjust person expect to receive anything from the Lord. If I regard iniquity in my heart, God will not answer my prayers, the Bible says. So if you're clinging to the world and to sin and you haven't surrendered to the Lord, God is good to the just and the unjust. He may take care of a lot of your needs just because he's good to everybody. But with your important petitions, first thing you ought to be praying for is mercy, right? Luke 18.3, And the publican, standing far off, he came to church, would not so much as lift his eyes to heaven, but he smote upon his breast, and he prayed, and he said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. So what was that first prayer? Did Jesus hear that prayer? And do we want that mercy? <coughs> psalm 51, after David's great transgression, this psalm was written, and you know how it begins? Have mercy upon me, O God. According to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. And the part, one of the first parts of my prayer virtually every day is this prayer for God's mercy. And, uh, you know, we pray a lot more for power in the morning, for mercy at night. Because we've got like the day's record to take care of. And it's important to keep short accounts with God. And every day you've fallen, as you probably do, spread those things out before the Lord and ask for His forgiveness. In the morning you pray not only for mercy, but for strength and grace to follow Him, to serve Him. Matthew 14, 30. When he saw the wind was boisterous, he was afraid and beginning to sink. He cried out, Lord, save me. Important short prayer. Luke 23, 42. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, the thief on the cross. He said, Lord, remember me when you come in your king, into your kingdom. Now, are these prayers effective? Talking about the importance and things happen when you pray. I don't have you ever felt different after you prayed and asked for forgiveness? You ever felt a peace? You ever felt a burden roll away? Some people have never even really asked God to forgive their sins because they think they've just gone too far or that somehow God can't lift that burden. And um, you need to believe more. Jesus would not have paid all that he paid for you to be forgiven if it wasn't possible for you to be forgiven. I was watching this special one time about um, a submarine that was trapped on the bottom of the ocean. And the Navy was trying to develop a way to raise it to the top. And they devised something that's pretty simple and pretty ingenious is they put a series of very strong cables and straps underneath the submarine. They connected them together above the submarine and they brought all these bags down, these great big nylon bags, and then they let air into the bags. And little bubbles of air that went into these bags made the bags inflate and the bags got bigger and bigger and pretty soon it lifted that massive steel structure off the ocean floor and they did it all with these tanks of air. Bubbles, they're called lift bags. And they discovered these Egyptian pillars in the Mediterranean, great stone pillars. And they said, how are you going to move those? And Navy guys, oh, no problem. We'll put lift bags under them. They lift these stones off the bottom of the ocean. All the little prayers that you're praying, they add up. And they can move heaven. Some of you maybe have been praying for others for many years that God would intervene in their lives. That's prayers of intercession. You know, God, I believe you can store prayers. Sometimes you pray for a long time for something or somebody, and it's not like God has forgotten any of it. I think that they, um, you can draw upon them. I know of people who have been converted by the prayers of their parents after their parents died. All those bubbles filled the bag. You have prayers of intercession in the Bible. You can read about where Abraham is praying with God, and you notice how he does it. He says, Lord, if there's, if there's 50 in the city, would you spare the city? God, God knows that he, he's getting ready to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. God knows that Abraham is worried about Lot and his family. It's, it's like his brother. It's like his son. Say, I'll spare, it for, I'll spare it for 50. How about 45? How about 40? What about 30? Would you go 10? And so he's pleading, he's interceding that God would spare the city because he didn't want Lot to be destroyed. Finally, because he had pleaded so long, God said, look, I couldn't find 10 righteous in the city, but I'm sending angels to get Lot out before it's destroyed. How's that sound? And so did his intercession work? 
Sometimes you notice that God didn't answer Abraham's prayer the way he thought he would. He thought he'd just spare the city. What he did is he saved Lot, which was the real core of his prayer. James 5, 16. Confess your trespasses one to another and pray for one another that you might be healed. Intercede for one another. Has anyone ever come to you and said, hey, could you pray for me about this or that? Uh, you know, pastors get that a lot. And uh, I've, I've already talked to the Lord about forgiving me for the times that people have asked me to pray for them and I forgot and I don't even remember what those things are anymore because I, I just don't want to face that in the judgment. So one of the ways I deal with that is people say, could you pray for me? And either in my heart or with them right then, I'll pray or I'll write it down because I'm always afraid I'm going to forget. But it is important that we pray and intercede with each other. Any of you have a prayer list? I have a list, prayer list. Um, and I think it's a good idea to, because we're human, we forget. Do you ever get on your knees, you start praying, your mind wanders? Who will, who will admit that? Who won't admit it? But it's still true. <clears throat> and here you are, you're talking to God, and you're wanting to think about God, and the dumbest things come into your mind. Sometimes embarrassing things. Some things that aren't even Christian pop into your mind. And and what do you do? You say, oh, Mike, you know I try to pray, Lord, just I keep getting distracted. You discipline yourself. You get good at whatever you practice. And so if you're praying and your mind wanders, bring it back. It wanders, bring it back. And you will learn over time to become focused in your prayers. And it gets better. It really does. And pray for the Holy Spirit to help you as you pray. Because it's the Spirit that takes our mutterings and mumblings and makes them eloquent before God. And so don't be discouraged if your mind wanders. Say, Lord, you know I'm human. Forgive me and just bring it back and talk to him. And be specific when you pray. Don't just say, well, it's time for prayer. Better get on my knees. I'll watch my walk. When five minutes are done. I'm getting back up again. Is that prayer? I mean, what if you had an appointment to talk to the Queen of England? And you went in, and you got there, and she said, now what's your request? He said, I don't know, I'm just so glad to be here. Okay, well, we'll have some tea and let you go. If you're coming, and you have an appointment to talk to the king, and, you, and they're saying, what can I do for you? I mean, you, you just think about when uh, Queen Esther, she came before King Ahasuerus. Here he is, the, the king of one of the greatest empires in the world. And every time she came... He said, what is your request? What can I do for you? Up to half my kingdom, and I'll do it. Why did he say that to Esther, up to half my kingdom? Because he loved her. And so you see, he's basically saying, anything you want, right? How does Jesus feel about his church? How much did he pay for his church? And so when people who are in his church come to the Lord with an earnest request. And by the way, did Esther spend time praying before she came with that request? Do you know she actually came with the king to the king with three requests? He said yes to all of them. Everything she asked, he said yes. Now, is the Lord less inclined to answer our prayers? Do you know the word prayer does not appear in the book Esther? Because it was written, matter of fact, the word God does not appear in the book of Esther. Because the book was written while they were captives in Persia, and you had to be careful uh, about mention, mentioning other religions. But she had all the people fasting for three days. What do you think they were doing while they're fasting? They're praying. Who are they praying to? They're praying to God. For what? That the people aren't annihilated. Because there was a law that they would all be annihilated. By the way, God's people are going to have to face a similar law before the end. So we're going to need to know how to pray. You know how Esther fasted and prayed? Didn't eat or drink. Now, I'm not recommending that. There is the most severe fast. When Jesus fasted in the wilderness, he didn't eat for 40 days. He fasted and he prayed. When Paul, after finding Jesus on the road to Damascus, he did not eat or drink. Three days. You don't go. You'll die after that. But that's the most severe fast. I don't recommend that. But are, are there times when we need to fast and pray? Man had his son brought to Jesus, demon-possessed, asked the disciples to pray that the demon might be cast out. Couldn't, they couldn't do it. it. means even the apostles struggled with getting some prayers answered. So don't feel bad. They went to Jesus and said, why wasn't our prayer answered? 
Christ said, this kind does not come out except by prayer and fasting. I've got a friend. By the way, he's, he and his family are going to be joining our church here. I won't tell you who it is, though. And I saw him, hadn't seen him in several weeks, and he lost quite a bit of weight. I said, uh, brother, what happened? He said, I read where Jesus fasted for 40 days. I thought I'd try it. I said, you went 40 days without eating? He said, well, you know, I'd, I'd have a little juice or a little soup, he said, but basically, he said, no, I didn't eat anything. It's just very light stuff like that. I said, how do you feel? He says, I feel great. And uh, he, he looked amazing. He says, you know, the Bible doesn't say if you fast. Jesus said when you fast. And he said, this kind doesn't come forth but by prayer and fasting. And something you might pray about is, Lord, how might I fast and pray? Sometimes we don't get answers because there's just not much intensity to our prayers. We're not that serious about it. Or maybe we don't believe that God really answers prayer. So there are prayers of intercession. Uh, I'm jumping around a little bit here. Didn't want to confuse Cheryl. She made some slides. Luke 22, 31. Did Jesus pray for the apostles? The Lord said, Simon, Simon. Who is he talking to? Peter. Behold, Satan has desired to have you that he might sift you as wheat. Is it only Peter the devil wanted? Or does the devil want you? He's desired that he might have you and sift you like wheat, but I've prayed for you that your faith does not fail. And when you're converted, strengthen the brethren. Did Jesus pray prayers of intercession? Did Jesus ever pray for you? He did. You know how? Christ said in John 17, Lord, not only do I pray for these, the apostles, he said, I'm praying for those who believe through their word. Well, that would be me. So Jesus prayed for you. Did Jesus believe his prayers were answered? He said to Peter, and when you're converted, not if, strengthen the brethren. He knew his prayer would be answered. Whatever I ask my father, he does for me. He believed that. Private prayer. Sometimes it's important that you know, we just got done praying as a church family together. But for your spiritual health, you need to have time alone with God. If you're in a family, I hope you have family worship together. Mark 1.35, now in the morning, having risen a long time before it was daylight, he went out and departed to a solitary place. Daniel went to his upper room to pray. We, do you have a place, a private place for prayer? Luke 9.18, it happened as it was, he was alone praying. Luke 9.18, as he was alone praying, his disciples joined him. And he said, who do the crowds say that I am? They've often found Jesus praying. He'd wake up sometimes early, get off by himself and pray. At just this time, sometimes I'm walking through the house and I feel impressed to pray and I'll get off, either go in our bedroom, my office, shut the door and just get on my knees there at the desk and feel I ought to pray about something. Sometimes I feel like I ought to pray because I'm thinking, boy, I'm not feeling very spiritual right now. And I'll get down and pray. And I don't feel like praying. I know I need to pray. Sometimes it's the times you feel like it the least is when you need it the most. You know, years ago when the early missionaries went to Africa and uh, they taught them the importance of private prayer and out there in the bush, a lot of them would leave the villages every morning and they would go off and they had kind of their own little Bethel out there among some brush or under a tree and they, after months and years of praying, they all had their own trails that went to their little chapel of prayer out there in the brush. And uh, they all knew whose trail was whose trail. Wake up in the morning, they'd all fan out, and they'd have their quiet time with God, and then come back and go about their business in the village. And sometimes they'd chide each other gently and say, brother, looks like grass is growing on your prayer path. <laughs> so how's your prayer path? Is the grass growing there? We need our private time of prayer. Remember in your prayers to not only be telling God what you want, be thanking Him. Last night, Pastor Ross and I uh, did a live broadcast. It was the first time AFTV's done a live broadcast. I don't know. I think there might be six of you that saw it. It was something that came together very quickly. Uh, we may air it again someday, but uh, we, were, we were really scrambling at the last minute. As a matter of fact, when they finally went live on the air, I was still getting a drink. I didn't know we were live. And someone said, you're live. I went, oh, I threw my bottle back. <laughs> 
<laughs> so, I mean, we were really praying, right? The, the, the questions, we were taking questions off the internet, and they were coming in, and we were having all kinds of problems. We prayed. At the last minute, it all came together after my drink. And the Lord blessed the program, and uh, afterward, we thought, oh, that's great. And we were going out the door, and I thought, you know, we ought to stop and thank God for answering our prayer. We were all in a hurry to ask him to help us, and he did. And now we're going to just go on our merry way and forget to thank him. And so thanks ought to be part of prayer. Daniel's getting ready to go to the lion's den, and he's still, we just read it. He got on his knees and he prayed, and he thanked God for answering those prayers. John eleven forty one, Jesus said, Father, I thank you that you've heard me, and I know you always hear me. Should we be able to pray like that, like he prays? In the book, Stems to Christ, page 103, we need to praise God more for his goodness, for his wonderful works to the children of men. That's a quote from Psalm 107, 8. Our devotional exercises should not consist wholly in asking and receiving. Let us not always be thinking about our wants and never the benefits we receive. We do not pray any too much, but we're too sparing in giving thanks. And then as we talk about prayer, there should be some passion in your prayers. Job said in 23, Job 23, verse 3, Oh, that I knew where I might find him, that I might come even to his seat in order to order my cause before him and fill my mouth with arguments to reason with God, to plead with God. James says, five, James 5, 16, the effective, fervent prayer. Are our prayers a little languid and lackadaisical and spiritless and, oh, prayer time. Okay, let's pray. Is it done yet? Oh, we're done. I mean, there ought to be a passion. We ought to realize, is prayer life and death? It is. If not ours, the others we're interceding for, there ought to be passion in our prayer. If we all realize that prayer makes a difference, that people really will be saved or not based on our intercession, we may be saved or not based on our prayers, answers are given or not given based on our asking, We'd pray a lot more. Jesus says, pray that you enter not into temptation. Any of us have any problems with temptation? Like every day? What does Jesus say the answer is? You will be part of the Lord's prayer. Lead us not into temptation. That's not that we're begging God not to tempt us. It means lead us away our natural bent towards temptation. We ought to be praying that God will keep us. Neglecting that could be the reason you're easily falling. Pray with passion in your prayers. 1 Samuel 1.10, you read about Hannah when she was praying for a child. She was in bitterness of soul and she prayed and she wept with such anguish, probably rocking back and forth and her lips were moving that Eli said, are you drunk? Why? Because she's just pouring out her heart. Hosea 12 verse 3, he took his brother by the heel. He's talking about Jacob. He took his brother by the heel, Jacob, when he was born, you know that story, in the womb. And in his strength, he struggled with God. Yes, he struggled with the angel and prevailed. He wept and he sought favor with him. When Jacob wrestled with the angel and he said, I will not let you go except you bless me. Do you approach your prayers like that? We should be praying big prayers. I want to illustrate this and I'm going to need a volunteer. You want to come up? She didn't know I was going to do this. But um, just come on up over here, Heather. Bear with me here for a moment. Okay. You know what that is? Ping pong. You stay right here. Ping pong ball, okay? Well, hold that. Very heavy. Could you carry one of those? Yep. Let's see. All right. Could you, could you carry one all day long? Probably. All right. Wooden body, right? All right. Turn around, face over there. I'm going to throw this at you, all right? One, two, did that hurt? Nope. Okay. All right, you know what this is? <laughs> Golf ball, all right. Can you carry that all day long? Maybe. It's a little, little harder. Um, all right, let me on, turn and face that way. <laughs> a second. Did that hurt? Not too bad. <laughs> How's your insurance? Okay, <laughs> let me see. All right, we're not quite done yet. All right. 
<laughs> you know what that is? That's a bowling ball. We'll hold that here for a second. Okay. Turn over, face that way. Just, <laughs> 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 All right. Ping pong ball, that's the way most Christians pray. Golf ball, the way Christians who actually attend church pray. Thank you very much. This is how we ought to be praying. Our prayers are, are so weak, we don't put much passion in them. We don't act like we're talking to God. And uh, we have a neighbor that we told him, we're taking your bowling ball to church. You really ought to come with it. But he just lent us his bowling ball. <laughs> Prayer ought to be with more, more passion, more enthusiasm. Let me read another quote to you here. Yeah, praying big prayers. Here's from, this is from Spurgeon. Prayer pulls down the rope. Prayer pulls down the rope below, and the great bell rings above in the ears of God. Some scarcely stir the bell, for they pray so languidly, others give only an occasional jerk at the rope. But he who communicates with heaven is the man who grasps the rope boldly with his whole body, pulls continuously with all of his might. Is the devil afraid of your prayers? Well, he should be. Some of us, if our prayers are like the typical Christian prayer, and when you pray, pray believing. Only God can move mountains, but faith and prayer can move God. Mark eleven twenty four. Therefore I say to you, whatever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them, and you'll have them. Now, it doesn't mean you'll get the answer right away, but believe that God hears it. And God answers the prayer of every believer. may not answer it on your schedule, which means you also pray with patience. Matthew 9, 27. Jesus departed from there, and two blind men followed him, crying out and saying, Son of David, have mercy on us. By the way, they prayed that prayer several times. Finally, Jesus stopped, and he said to the blind man, Do you believe that I'm able to do this? They said to him, Yes, Lord. Then he touched their eyes and said, According to your faith, let it be to you. And their eyes were open. God is infinitely more willing to answer our prayers than we are to ask them. James 1.6 But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind, for he's a double-minded man that is unstable in all of their ways. We should be praying with each other. We should be praying uh, passionately. And you know, God wants us also to pray patiently. Sometimes we, uh, we ask God for something. If we don't get the answer right away, we give up. But he's, how often did Elijah pray for the rain? Seven times. Another way you might say it is he prayed until it came. Once you know something is God's will, you continue to pray for it heard about a pastor that was walking down the sidewalk one time and he saw this five-year-old boy reaching up to try and get a doorbell standing at a door. The pastor thought, well, I could help him out. And he walked over and said, can I help you, son? He picked him up so he could ring the doorbell. The little boy rang the doorbell and he put him back down. He said, now, mister, you're supposed to run like crazy. And the little boy ran. <laughs> you ever have anyone like ring your doorbell and run off? <laughs> we sometimes do that with the Lord. Prayer is not just asking. Sometimes prayer is listening. A man who took care of an opera house one night got a phone call. And a lady said, I was in the balcony tonight for the performance. And I lost a very expensive diamond earring. And he, she, he said, what seat number were you in? He said, well, I'll go check. This is for the days of cell phones and caller ID. And so he said, just wait on the line. So he went, he looked around, he found the earring down on the ground, came back to the phone, and she'd hung up. Waited for her to call back, she never called back, put an ad in the paper, never responded, became impatient, never got what she was asking for. And I just wonder how often we become impatient with our prayers, we don't wait on the Lord for those answers. Well, there's a lot more I could say, and this is a subject might, might have a part two to it, but uh, we need to be a people that are praying. Amen?
Uh, years ago, I heard a parable about a man, he gets to heaven, and an angel's taking him on a tour, and he sees all the beautiful mansions. He's waiting to get to his mansion. He looks up on a hill, and there's a beautiful mansion. He says, wow, that's beautiful. He said, yeah, that's the Apostle Paul's mansion. And he sees another hill. He says, oh, that's gorgeous. What a beautiful, that's John the Baptist mansion. And he goes along, finally sees this incredibly big building, but it's, it, it's much bigger than any of the others, but it's not as ornate. And he said, who lives there? He says, no one lives there. That's a warehouse. He said, a warehouse in heaven? What's that for? He said, that actually holds all the prayers that we wanted to answer for people, but they didn't ask. Won't it be sad if you get to heaven and you see a warehouse filled with prayers that God wanted to answer for you, but they never were sent because you didn't ask. He is infinitely more willing to answer your prayers than you probably are to pray them. And so, maybe we need to say, Lord, teach us to pray and believe that prayer really does make a difference. Just this last week, maybe it was two weeks ago, uh, Nathan misplaced his wallet, driver's license, Christmas money, and uh, we were all looking for it, couldn't find it, disappointed. We got down, we prayed, and a little while later, I heard Karen squeal or say, praise the Lord, and sure enough, he looked somewhere, he looked several times before, and there it was, found it. And so, little things like that. How many of you have had answers to prayer? Believe it works. We need to be praying. We need to be praying that we'll be more like Christ. What's the most important thing that we could pray about? That we are willing to come to the place where we say like Jesus, not my will, thy will be done, Lord. Let me live my life for you. Is that your desire?